Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Once again, a sultry jazz voice version. We're going to be following through in our series about how we carry out a titration. In this video, we're going to be talking all about technique. Okay, so that's going to cover a few different things. Uh, we're going to talk about our rinsing or kind of prep technique. Um, how do we make sure that our glassware is clean and ready to use? Okay, then looking at how do we use the burette? And so, you know, that, that in, involves kind of, you know, the actual technique and then also um, reading of it. Okay, um, so there, there's some of the things, kind of areas that we're going to cover in this video. Okay, so basically rinsing or the prep work is really important. It helps to maintain that accuracy. And it does that by minimising contamination. Now that contamination might be water, diluting our solution, or it might be um, other reactants, or it might even be uh, foreign substances. You know, so something that is totally unrelated, that's not supposed to be there, that's going to influence our result. Okay, so we're going to use good rinsing technique so that we can be really accurate because we're minimising our contamination. Okay. So there's three main bits of equipment that we need to focus on how what what we do when we rinse it. Okay, so first thing that we do with our conical, we're looking at our conical flask. So our conical flask, we rinse with water only. Okay, so um, now when we're talking about deionized water, uh, we're talking about water. We're, we're specifically thinking about deionized water here. Okay, so I'm not going to mention it specifically each time. I'm going to take that as a given at this point. Um, and so, yeah, so for a conical flask that we only rinse with water, okay, we'll see that, that that's kind of different when we talk about a burette and then with the pet. Um, okay, so now the reason for that is that we, we're in our conical flask that we dispense a very specific number of moles of a given reactant, okay? And so we don't want in our rinsing to add in any uh, any more moles of reactant that, that might influence things, you know? So if we dispense, you know, if we want to make sure that there's exactly 25.00 mils of, uh, the, you know, the reactant that's going in the flask and that's going in there, but then actually, when because of um, we've rinsed it, you know, with water and then a little bit of, of our reactant, we've actually may have, you know, added maybe 0.1 of a mil or, or maybe even more, depending on how carelessly we've rinsed it, you know, we, we might be closer to kind of half a mil more uh, that we haven't actually accounted for, that then that's there and that's going to react with the substance that we add from our burette, um, but we haven't actually accounted for that. So it's going to muck up our result without us even realising it. But, so what we do then is that we only rinse down a conical flask with water. So this will help to clean away any other contaminants, um, you know, so anything that was in the flask before you did your titration, um, or any le leftover residue from a previous um, trial of a titration, because what you'll see when we do titrations is that we do multiple trials, um, so that we can get an average. And then, um, yeah, so it will rinse away anything that's contaminating, but it won't potentially jeopardise your existing titration. Okay, so then, with a burette, and then also we'll, we'll do with a pipette, that we first rinse with water, and then we second rinse with the reactant to be dispensed. Okay, so we get a small amount of water and we rinse our burette to rinse away any contaminants, and then we get a small amount of our reactant to be dispensed. We rinse our burette with it and then um, chuck it out. Um, what happens with that is that it basically coats the inside of our burette um, with a you know, thin layer of that reactant that's going to be added so that we don't have any leftover water that's going to dilute the substance that we put in there. And then our pipette, we treat the same way. First, we rinse it with water, and then the second one, um, we rinse it with the reactant to be pipetted. Okay, so a little bit of that substance, you know, we, we kind of we physically manipulate the, the pipette, which is, you know, a thin glass tube, so we kind of we tip it and spin it and rotate it so that the, all the inside surfaces are covered, and then we, we get rid of that solution. So then it's pretty much ready to go. Okay. Um, now, when you are, you know, with the burette, you only need to do that once. 
once you've got the reactant in there, any time that you top it up with that same reactant, you don't need to re-rinse it. Okay, and likewise with your pipette, as long as you've you've prepped your pipette and you're only using it for one substance, um, and that you know that one particular solution of that substance, um, that then you know it's it's clean. It's you know it's yeah it's it's all good to go. You don't need to keep re-rinsing it. Now, if you were testing one kind of acid solution and then you did titrations and then you were doing a different solution of the same acid the next time around, you couldn't you'd have to clean it in between because you don't know that they're the identical concentration. Okay? They might you might know their concentration, but their values would be slightly different, and so you can't assume cleanliness from one round to another round. So, if in doubt. Rinse, basically. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to kind of move on to to start to think about technique. All right. So up on the screen now is an image of um, of what the burette looks like at the different stages through the titration. Okay. Now you'll notice on the image that it says, okay, well the acid is in the flask and the base is in the burette. It does not have to be that way. That's often how we would do it, but not. It doesn't specifically have to. It tends to be more for convenience or from a logistical point of view than a chemistry point of view. Okay, like it's just, you know, maybe the color change of the indicator gives us a better result that way around. Okay, so don't don't assume that it, it has to stay that way always. But okay, so on the far left of the image you see that it's um, that the burette is kind of set up ready to go. So the burette's been filled up with the solution, we've recorded our initial reading, and then it says to plus plus or minus um, 0.05 mils. Okay, so what we can recognize, um, now some teachers will tell you this differently, but trust me, I've worked with enough glassware in doing this, that you cannot accurately measure a, the volume in a burette to anything more accurate than um, plus or minus um, 0.05 mils, which is half of the smallest marking on the, the burette. Okay, so you know, so you might have, you'll see in the next kind of one, you know, maybe you've got 27 and you've got 28, and then you've got 10 markings in between. Totally, that was totally 10. Um, and then each, so you were, we're talking plus or minus kind of half of one of those markings is um, your, that's your limit of, of reading. You can't, you can tell that the, the, the liquid is either on one of those lines or between one of those lines, but you can't tell more accurately than that. Yes, now some overly confident chemistry teachers of other students in other schools will tell you differently, but um, they are not telling the truth, okay? Or at least they have been led to believe that you can. But basically anything other than that is an estimate. It's, it's a, you're just fudging it, okay? And so to do so is, is, is not valid scientifically, okay? So recording that initial value, and then we open up the tap. We dispense some of that, the, the, the base in this case, in, this, in that diagram, um, out of the bottom of the burette into the flask, we swirl it, and we observe some colour changing going on. Okay, now it hasn't reached the point of where of the equivalence point. So what we what we notice with that is we see a, a quick colour change that disappears straight away as as the reactant mixture is swirled. Okay, so you know, and then as we get closer and closer, as we've dispensed more and more, what we do is we slow down our our dispensing. So. Initially, the burette, the, 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 the reactant can come out really fast, okay, because we're nowhere near the equivalence point. But as we get closer and closer, we want to make sure that we nail it really accurately, so we slow right down. And so we might even, as we get to that end point, or that we might be going dropwise, so drop by drop out of the end of that burette, nice and slow, so that you can monitor exactly when that colour change happens. Because basically, when it does, it happens in the, in the space of one drop. So you want to catch it, you don't want to miss that. Okay, and so you can see in that third kind of pa panel of the image that that's where that one drop is going to cause that color change. So what we often can do, we can then close the burette at that point, and then where it's got that little droplet at the end, we can actually use our dropper bottle to rinse it off into the conical flask. It's come out of the burette, so it's counted in the volumes that we've dispensed, um, but we want it in the flask so that it can cause our, our color change. So we can rinse it down, we get a colour change, and then we record that final volume. Okay, and so then what we can do is we can say, all right, well, this is our initial volume, and this was our final volume. And so we can say this amount is the amount dispensed. The amount that's actually come out of the bottom of the burette, it's into the conical flask, um, causing our reaction. Okay, so we always need to measure these two volumes and then take and then subtract to work out how much base or how much reactant 
has been added to cause that reaction. Okay, and so now what you're going to see is an image um, of that zooming in of kind of that meniscus to kind of illustrate this point that I was making here. Okay, so what you can see is that remember that, that we have a meniscus when we've got a liquid in a container, so that is that curved line on the surface. And you can see that it's kind of it's low at the bottom and then it's high up at the sides because we've got quite a narrow glass tube. So what we have to do is you always have to read the bottom of the meniscus, read the volume off the bottom of the meniscus. It's the only accurate way to be able to, to judge it. Okay, so you've got to minimize parallax error. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are getting down at right angles to where that scale is. You're not reading it from down below or up above. <coughs> And then what we can do, like I was saying, is that you can only record our values to the nearest um, 0.05 of a mil. So that is, if it's on the line, you know, so if this, if this was our, our line kind of marking, so if it's on the line, then we would have um, something zero, point, point, something zero mils. So a zero in our last decimal place. Whereas if we had that same thing and it was between, maybe that and here, then we would have point <coughs> something five <coughs> of a mil. So that reflects that it's between the lines, but we're not trying to estimate any closer than that because you just can't, even with practice, that it's still basically a guess as to whether it would be you know, point something four or point something three or point something two or point something six. It's all very rubbery, okay? Whereas this, this is much simpler and also within the limits of what's reasonable. If it's on the line, if the bottom of the meniscus rests exactly on that line, you have a zero in your last decimal place. If it's anywhere in between, it's a five. Okay? Um, and if in doubt, you can get a second opinion, you can get a teacher's opinion to be able to, to see kind of where that meniscus sits if you need to. Okay? But accurate reading technique really helps with our volume measurements. That also includes making sure that the burette is vertical. <coughs> Pardon me because that comes back to our concept of parallax error. If the burette is actually leaning towards you or leaning away from you, or it's it's not vertical kind of sideways, um, you know, it's kind of tilted to the left or right, then you're not actually not going to accurately measure where that meniscus rests. So that's one reason why we tend to prefer burette clamps, because we can hold the burette uh, much more easily in the vertical position uh, with minimal fuss. Okay, so we've talked through rinsing, we've talked through our setup, we've talked through using the burette, and then reading, um, you know, and so thanks very much for watching. We'll, we'll in the next kind of videos, we'll go through um, the calculation process. All right, thanks for watching. Bye for now.